Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Silky, and um, I am a, an analyst at Congressional Research Service. And I'm going to moderate today's hearing. I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview on gangs in Central America, and then let our three distinguished panelists um, make presentations, and then hopefully respond to your questions on this really interesting and, and, and um, kind of um, delicate topic. Uh, since at least the mid-2000s, I first wrote my first gang paper for Congress in 2005, to be exact. Uh, Congress has maintained an active interest in the um, gang violence in Central America and on the ties between uh, Central American gangs in the United States um, and in the region. Since 2008, Congress has appropriated $40 million for anti-gang efforts in Central America specifically and more than $800 million for broader security programs that are now called the Central America Regional Security <coughs> Initiative. The Mara Salvatrucha, MS-13, and its main rival, the 18th Street Gang, both of whom have origins in Los Angeles, California, continue to threaten citizen security and challenge government authority in Central America. As many of you know, gang-related violence has been particularly acute in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, which have had among the highest homicide rates in the world. Some analysts say that the gangs have become sophisticated transnational criminal organizations with increasing ties to drug trafficking organizations, while others will disagree. While some governments have continued to embrace tough law enforcement-led strategies to dealing with gangs, others have moved away from repressive anti-gang strategies. The Salvadoran government facilitated a, a historic and controversial truce involving the country's largest gangs in 2012. The truce contributed to a large reduction in homicides, before beginning to seemingly unravel in recent months. The truce carries serious risks for the Salvadoran government that will take office on June 1st, 2014, such as what might happen if it were to abruptly end and prompt an escalation in intra-gang violence. Despite the risks involved, the truce has been supported by the OAS and the EU, but not by the US government. US agencies have engaged on both the law enforcement and preventive sides of dealing with Central American gangs for many years and announced a 2007 strategy called the U.S. Strategy to Combat Criminal Gangs from Central America and Mexico. The strategy focuses on diplomacy, repatriation, law enforcement, capacity enhancement, training, and prevention. There are serious questions, though, that remain for the U.S. and for many other donors. They include, a lot has been done on the preventive side of the gang phenomenon, but what about reintegration? How have increasing U.S. criminal deportations affected the gang situation in Central America? Are the U.S. or other donors willing to help Central Americans deal with the overcrowding and the insecurity in the region's prisons? Can a solution to the gang problem in Central America really be achieved without involving the gangs themselves? Today we are lucky to have three distinguished speakers here to give brief presentations and then answer your questions related to gangs in Central America. First, we'll start with uh, John Feely, who's the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State of PDAS for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the State Department. Um, John Feely's been in the State Department since 1990. He served as the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in Mexico. He's also been the Director of the Department of Central American Affairs and Deputy Director for, Cent for Caribbean Affairs. Um, he's been posted in Mexico, Dominican Republic, and Colombia, among other places. Then we have um, Ambassador Adam Blackwell, who was a Canadian um, career diplomat. He first joined the service in 1980 and served throughout Africa, and in Mexico, New York, and as ambassador to the Dominican Republic. He's been at the OAS since 2006, and is currently serving as the secretary for the Secretariat for Multidimensional Security at the OAS. And finally, um, Susan Cruz, um, who has spent time mobilizing marginal communities in El Salvador, and has also founded Sin Fronteras, a California nonprofit organization dedicated to serving youth in conflict with the law. She keeps herself at the forefront of social justice issues related to youth in Central and North America and has developed publications on how to respond to gangs for the city of Los Angeles and for the National District Attorneys Association. She's presented on various topics that are related to the topic of gangs in Central America in the US, Europe, and in Latin America. And beyond her educational and professional background, it is her personal experience as a pan-ethnic immigrant and a gang-involved youth that strengthened her connection with the youth she has had the honor of working with. So I hope that you guys have a lot of questions, and I hope we have time to kind of engage in the discussion. Thank you. Um, Pete, I speak. Sure. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, and thank you very much for taking the time uh, to join us this morning. I want to, uh, Katie, if you would pass on to uh, Congressman Farr, my sincere thanks 
for invoking this space, this dialogue. I am uh, one of the dinosaurs of the American Foreign Service in that I have had the privilege of only working in one regional area. Now, if folks join, they have to sort of have a, uh, a major minor, they bounce around, almost everybody does some tours in the hub or in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Pakistan. By vocation, I have spent um, my entire career working on issues related to the Western Hemisphere, whether here in Washington or overseas. And I am always sad, quite frankly, at the amount of ignorance that exists in the United States about Latin America and the Caribbean and uh, the Western Hemisphere in general. Um, we sort of tend to fall back on stereotypes very frequently, and Americans need to understand that this region is perhaps the most strategic region of the world in terms of American interests, not necessarily the foreign policy cognoscenti's interests. Things that go boom in the night, chemical weapons, state-on-state uh, -state conflict, genocide, ethnic cleansing, those are always going to grab the headlines. And the last time that happened in the Western Hemisphere were the wars in Central America in the 1980s. But the fact is that this is a strategically important region for the food that we eat, the energy that we consume, the very demography of our country. So it's with great pleasure that I join you this morning, and I salute you and I thank you. I'm always reminded of the great words of um, a New York Times journalist Scotty Resnick, who once said, Americans will do absolutely anything for Latin America, except learn about it. So I am hopeful that we will all learn something here. And Claire, let me thank you. I should joke. Here, we've got to stop meeting like this. Claire and I have had uh, the opportunity and the pleasure to share a number of panels uh, relating to Mexico, Central America, and other issues in the region. And I always learn something when I'm seated next to uh, this distinguished scholar. And thank you very much to Susan and to Adam. Susan, we haven't met, but uh, just listening to your biography, you bring something that none of us up here brings, and that is firsthand personal experience with this issue. And I look forward to uh, learning from you this morning. Okay, what I will do is go very quickly over um, U.S. policy regarding gangs in Central America. Um, I think the, uh, it, it, as Claire said in her opening statement, and I won't reprise a lot of that, um, the Central American countries, and in particular the northern tier, as we refer to it, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, face a number of economic governance and security challenges uh, that stem from the drug and gang-fueled violence, the corruption, and other obstacles to effective governance and leadership. Uh, there is, in, there are, exists in several countries, uh, significant judicial impunity, uh, as Claire mentioned, among the world's highest murder rates, uh, among the world's lowest tax revenues as a percentage of GDP. Uh, you've got a very serious uh, and large and important youth bulge uh, in all of those countries. And they have limited access to education, to employment, uh, to opportunity. And so in that context, it's understandable uh, why gangs provide an outlet for those folks looking for opportunities. Um, gangs are a manifestation of that broader inequality, that broader lack of social mobility, that broader lack of uh, ladders up to a better life. The numbers alone, I would argue, are, are simply staggering. And uh, let me read you a few things that come out of the 2012 UN Office on Drugs and Crime uh, study. They estimated that there were a total of 54,000 MS-13, that's the Marasalva Huja, and 18 uh, MS-18 uh, street gang members in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala alone. Guatemala leads with about 22,000 members. Um, El Salvador is a close second at 20,000, um, but it has, uh, importantly, the highest concentration of gang members as a percentage of the population, about 323 gang members per 100,000 citizens. Honduras has about 12,000 uh, gang members. Now, here's something that's very worrisome to us. Estimated gang membership in Guatemala and El Salvador nearly doubled since 2007. So we've clearly seen societies that are not offering the opportunities to youth, and they are seeing the gangs as a viable, and in many cases, a legitimate alternative to advance themselves. 
Let me say very clearly, and again, I'm very glad to see so many of you here, that Central American nations' success in addressing the challenges that gangs present are national security interests for them. They are national security interests for us here in the United States. Um, a region in Central America that is middle class, democratic, and secure is undeniably going to be a better and a stronger partner for the United States. Conversely, if they fail, we are going to face continuing security threats from narcotics, illicit trafficking in people, weapons, migration, organized crime, and possibly social instability in those countries. So we have an awful lot of work ahead of us, and we are, I would argue, only in the beginning of that work. Let me talk a little bit about the policy. Before you start any policy, you've got to do your analysis. Part of what we've done over the last several years is to analyze exactly why people join gangs. I've talked a little bit about that. The experts uh, say that the reasons are varied. There are a variety of risk factors, lack of economic opportunity, search for a social network, family breakdowns, migration. You have many single parent families. You have many people in those three countries that are uh, being raised by grandparents as their parents are here in the United States, whether documented or undocumented, working and sending money home. Um, and the old classic reason for gangs, self-protection rackets. Um, the, if you go back and you look at the history of gangs in New York uh, at the turn of the 20th century, you find the exact same things happening, people extorting their own people. And so people get caught up paying for protection and sometimes for young men and young women without opportunity, it's just easier to join those who are on the taking side of things as opposed to the giving side of things. We also analyze the impact that gangs have on society. Um, it's, it's always hard and you know the stats are frankly fuzzy math a lot of times. What percentage of crimes in each country are actually perpetrated by gangs? What are, uh, can be attributed to organized crime? What can be attributed to just common crime? But we do know that in addition to homicides, gangs uh, are involved in a number of illicit activities ranging from kidnapping to extortion to smuggling of drugs to smuggling of weapons and people. Uh, we know that in some places gangs actually fill the place of, uh, the, uh, of, state, of the state and local authority when there is no presence of un in undergoverned or weakly governed communities. Um, as I said, gangs provide security uh, in exchange uh, for attacks on society, um, and very frequently gangs in the northern tier will prevent local government authorities from providing services or even entering the community. There are two types of gangs, or well, many types, but you can break them down in, by two uh, sort of typologies. There are territorial gangs and there are transactional gangs. Uh, the territorial ones are the ones that I think people are most familiar with. They start the term as clica, a uh, small group. They start in neighborhoods. Uh, they tend to protect their turf. What they care about is their turf. When one gang crosses into another one, you have violence. Um, then there are, and this is what we're starting to see, almost uh, metastasizing groups that begin as territorial um, gangs begin to become transactional as they find links and nexuses with uh, organized crime. Uh, factors that uh, foster gang involvement, as well as the societal impact of gangs, require that we, the United States, and international partners have a balanced approach to tackle the problem. Um, a very uh, celebrated American public service uh, used to run the Office of National Drug Control Policy. He's now the new commissioner uh, the uh, Customs and Border Protection Service, Gil Kurlyakowski, has famously said on many times, you can't arrest your way out of this problem. You have to deal with this problem as a whole, in, in a holistic way, and one that looks at various uh, actions before people become gangs. Um, and our strategy attempts to do that. Very simply, our, we have sort of a four-fold approach to it. We recognize the absolute essential nature of a balanced approach. We have to prioritize prosperity, governance, and security. So it's a misnomer to think of CARSI as just security. It is the mechanism through which we fund many of our security-related programs, 
but it's important to understand that U.S. policy focuses on prosperity, governance, and security. So we look at programs, uh, or we fund programs uh, through CARSI that are focused on crime prevention, as I mentioned. Uh, we also focus on programs that look at law enforcement efforts. These are the actual capacity building and training of police, judicial officials, prosecutors, judges. Um, we also work in the actual providing of information and operational uh, information in law enforcement investigations, transnational investigations, um, arrests, the prosecution of criminal actors, all of these things. We've got to have a completely balanced focus here because if not, what we end up with is mano dura policies. And we've seen the iron fist policies. We've seen repeatedly that that simply doesn't work. You have to be more consistent than that. So what are some of the things that we do under there? As I said, governance, prosperity, and security. Let me talk about some of the things we do, and we can go into detail a little bit later uh, on this, but that focus on security. First, youth outreach centers. Under CARSI, we've uh, stood up about 120 youth outreach centers in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Panama. Um, I think these are pretty manifest, uh, manifestly um, uh, clear as to why we do this. You got to give people, you got to give young people other options. Um, they have been very successful. We do see that as you give, as we provide assistance to host national authorities in these centers, uh, you see crime rates drop, you see people actually getting education, you see greater interest in getting formal uh, jobs, uh, you see greater entrepreneurialism coming out of them. Uh, these are relatively low cost, but difficult to staff and manage and keep people going, and they suffer from the pressure from gangs to keep people out of them. But we believe that this absolutely must continue to be done. And it can only be done in partnership. This is not something where Americans can show up, set up a, you know, build a nice building with a couple of ping pong tables and, you know, a couple of basketball hoops and hope it'll happen. This requires the active participation of local partners. And we work through local partners. We also work in the security area with model precincts. Um, this is another thing that absolutely is essential to understanding how we help El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and any place, frankly, where you have gang problems, get out of those situations. And it boils down to two, two words, community policing. Um, the breakdown of trust between a society and its police authorities is an absolute component, an essential component, of any place where gangs are growing and being fostered. When police are seen as the enemy, when police are seen as the interlopers, you find that there is a natural tendency to demonize the other. The cops demonize the gang members, the gang members demonize the cops. There is no dialogue, there is no understanding. And so model police precincts <coughs> attempt to build that culture of community-based policing through confidence and dialogue and encounters between police and uh, members of the community. Things like tip hotlines, things like training, things like uh, police athletic leagues. These are all components of the model precinct program. Um, we found that there's a program called Gang Resistance Education and Training. Uh, they call it GREAT by its acronym. Uh, had enormous success. We work with little kids, 8 to 13. And these are not the kids who are going to be committing the crimes, but these are the kids who are susceptible to being drawn in and becoming the carne de cañón, the cannon fodder for the gang members. Um, and again, I've said, we, uh, as I said, we've had excellent success in that. We also, in the security area, work with vetted units. Vetted units in the police are extremely important. Uh, it's not a surprise to anybody here uh, that in Central America, and indeed throughout most of Latin America, the idea of being a policeman is not exactly thought of as a great career. Um, it is not something that people take pride in. It's not something, I come from a family of cops and firemen in New York. You know, getting that detective shield for my uncle was, you know, the, 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 the reason for a huge family party and a neighborhood celebration. Not the case in Latin America. Usually it is the lower socioeconomic elements of society that are drawn into policing. Usually they're paid poorly, they don't have a clear career path. Um, so vetted units is an attempt 
to pair the best of Latin American, uh, Central American police forces with American uh, federal agents uh, to link them up. Sometimes we link them up with local uh, authorities here in the United States, with state level police. We have in all three of the northern tier countries something we call the FBI's Transnational Anti-Gang Task Force, the CAG units. Um, and what these guys do basically is they become, they, the Central American members of it, they become a very cohesive, special and elite unit that stays together, at least that's the concept, that receives extra training, extra funding from uh, our uh, DEA and our FBI colleagues. Um, and, it, and they are focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is exploring the nexus between gangs in the United States, primarily in Southern California and Los Angeles, and uh, their, uh, their home countries. We also in the security area work on secondary prevention pilots. Uh, these target high-risk individuals and they aim to reduce the, the risk factors among the most at-risk youth. In this, we've had some very innovative and creative linkages with the city of Los Angeles. We've worked with their gang reduction and youth development uh, program. They have something that they call the Youth Services Eligibility Tool, which is nothing more than a methodology to be able to go out and spot the presence of the risk factors. What are the neighborhoods where you've got very high unemployment? Where do you see a high percentage of single family homes? Things like that. And through the use of this methodology, they're able to target areas in the northern tier and get through, uh, get through to them. I, um, final thing I will say, uh, and that's just on the security, I hope we have a chance to talk about some of the governance and some of the prosperity programs that we're working on. But let me just end with um, sort of a personal anecdote. I've been doing this for, for a, quite a while. And a question that I always get, whether it's in a hearing before uh, members of Congress or with journalists, is what does success look like? when you're talking about fighting transnational organized crime, or you're talking about fighting gang problems. What does it look like? How do, what, what's your end state? What do you envision? And then I used to get really frustrated because I would have reams of stats that I could talk about the inputs we were putting in. And it occurred to me one day that that's important, and we have to do that, and we have to, you know, as they say in Spanish, rendir cuentas and prove that we're good stewards of, of the American taxpayer dollar in these programs in support of American security. But what success really looks like is in any one of these countries, or in Mexico, where you have serious crime, both organized, common, where you have gang problems, picture a National Day celebration and a big parade, and a little kid gets separated from his or her family. When you were little kids here in America, and you went to the state fair, or you went down to you know, a big celebration, municipal celebration, what did your parents tell you? If you got lost, what did they say? They probably said, go find a policeman. Nobody in any of these countries is told that when they're a seven, eight, nine-year-old kid. Nobody in Mexico is told that. When I started work in Mexico 10 years ago, I got shaken down the first three days I was walking the streets in Mexico by a local cop. 10 years later, after consistent work with the DF police, I actually had several experiences with local police that were encouraging, enthusing. But what success looks like is when these societies, because keep in mind, it's their job. We are there to provide assistance. It's in our national security interest. But in these societies, when those little kids turn and look for a cop, and the cop represents honesty, decency, and someone who is there to protect and serve. Thanks very much. All right, may I have a microphone? Um, thanks, John, Susan, Claire, um, and Katie for organizing this. This is a, uh, I think as John put it, a, a, a really tough issue, um, multi-causal, uh, almost impossible to deal with in a morning, uh, 10 minute conversation. Um, so I do have a few handouts here, which I have listed some of the things I'm gonna mention, because I think give you some good background uh, to this. Four years ago, uh, when I took over this job as Secretary of Multidimensional Security at the OAS, I was absolutely appalled at the security situation 
uh, in the Americas. Uh, like John, I served in Mexico, uh, was our consul in Mexico, so got to visit uh, most of the country. Uh, and many of the places where large numbers of tourists were visiting, um, investments were being made, uh, were actually in conflict. Um, what we would more traditionally call a conflict. People throw out statistics, uh, 70, 80, 90 homicides, over 100,000. What that would translate to in the United States context is 300,000 murders a year in a country where, despite all of the horrible things that we saw in, um, in many of these uh, uh, schools, there was 15,000 murders last year. So imagine 300,000 murders in the United States. That's the context in Honduras uh, and El Salvador and Guatemala. Not just to mention the, the, the other costs, the, some people call them the epi epidemiology of, of, of crime and violence, uh, the social impacts, the living in fear, uh, creating a, a sustainable investment environment that I think uh, John was, uh, was referring to. The OAS, we wanted to do more than just send our condolences, uh, but we really frankly didn't know uh, what are the issues. We wanted to learn more. Um, so we did our homework, uh, and we worked with the OECD uh, and uh, some of the, what I would think of the best practice uh, police, including the United States, Canada, Chile, Colombia. Um, the World Bank, the IUB, and others, to develop a security sector diagnostic toolkit. To be able to go into El Salvador and Honduras and really do a, you know, we should say soup to nuts, but a really horizontal review of the security sector in these countries to better understand what are uh, the underlying issues. Uh, and frankly, uh, as John said, you know, we don't necessarily understand or we don't necessarily learn about Latin America. Well, frankly, many governments don't, in Latin America don't really understand the issues either. Um, and it was quite revealing, um, this diagnostic uh, process. Some of our conclusions, I think as John mentioned, Mano Dura, Super Mano Dura, or these kind of hard security policies had a lot of unintended consequences. It's very clear, 300% overpopulation in prisons. 300%. If I had brought you some of the photographs of some of the prisons that I have toured, um, you know, we have our Human Rights Commission uh, hearing, uh, hearings going on right now. Many of these prisons and many of these systems would fail any international standard. Gang communities were becoming increasingly isolated. I mean, you have to remember, these are communities. We're not talking about a bunch of thugs standing on the side of the street, where they may be. But we are talking about entire communities who are becoming even further distance from their, from their government. The leaders were becoming strengthened. Gang leaders, you're in a war, you're in combat. They're becoming strengthened. And the homicide rates had gone through the roof. I mean, we can show you charts from when the government of uh, El Salvador started this Mano Dura, the prison population, I mean, it's a peak. Uh, prison population went up, homicide rates uh, went up, and perception of government went way down. The other thing I think we need to understand is that gangs in the Central American context are as much a social economic phenomena as they are a criminal. And I like to say they're just a very violent expression of social exclusion. So it goes to say, the more you exclude them, the more you create this distance, uh, the greater the levels of violence uh, that you're going to have. And our conclusion to both the governments of El Salvador and Honduras is perhaps it's time to look at alternatives uh, and to think about uh, developing uh, some kind of strategy. And I'm going to mention a couple of papers here, which I think are, are really interesting to give you a little bit of the context of this very, very uh, challenging issue. Teresa Whitfield um, wrote a paper on mediating criminal violence, lessons from the gang truce in El Salvador. 
She works with the Humanitarian uh, Dialogue and based in Geneva. This is a paper that looks a little bit at the history, how these gangs were created in the 60s, um, the relationship between Los Angeles and, and the family and how they became really a replacement for family and, 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 and frankly the social fabric that we, we talk about. So, so I really recommend um, her paper. Unfortunate name, but James Colcane wrote a, a paper on strengthening mediation to deal with the criminal agendas, um, which I think if we look at uh, many of the challenges that I have faced in my career and in Africa and, and elsewhere, um, when you're doing conflict mediation and you're trying to design that end state that John spoke about, how do you replace the criminal rents? How do you replace that criminal um, Economy uh, and it's in traditional DDR uh, <coughs> one of the the R the reinsertion. And this is a problem that's going to be in Colombia. This is a problem we're having. We're going to have in Mexico. This is a problem we're having in in Central America. It's a problem we're having in Brazil. Is how do you find gainful, <coughs> licit uh, economic activity uh, to replace uh, to replace these criminal rents? Uh, Gary Slutkin to cure violence did a lot of work on what I was calling the epidemiology of violence, and I think it's a, a very uh, interesting uh, paper or thesis to read. Uh, the effective community gang-based, uh, community-based gang intervention that uh, Congressman Tony uh, Cardenas um, uh, put together, and John mentioned the, the great work that Los Angeles uh, has been doing. We also studied what the OAS has been doing in Colombia. We have a program called the Mission Map, a mission to accompany the process of peace, a mission to accompany the peace process, which has now been uh, ongoing for 10 years. Um, and you know, we've obviously looked at uh, papers and things that Claire uh, and others have written. So through uh, a very painful uh, process, um, we, working with I hate to say the government of El Salvador because really they, they were not helpful uh, in trying to um, present uh, a process. On the 9th of March 2012, a truce was announced. A truce which had very five very simple points to it. One, stop killing each other. Two, stop killing members of the security forces. Three, stop recruiting in the schools. And four, to allow reinsertion of those that want to find a, another alternative and to try and reduce civilian uh, casualties. In 2012, in June 2012, despite the moral hazard, and believe me, we really looked and thought about this very hard, the OAS agreed to be a guarantor uh, of this process. And over the two years, there have been some successes. Um, tenuous, but there have been some, some successes. If you look at the homicide rate of 2013, it's 50% lower than the homicide rate of 2012. Uh, yes, there's been good days and there's been bad days, and through this very messy electoral campaign, um, which is only just uh, included. Uh, ironically, on the 9th of March of this year. Um, but essentially, uh, we can say that there's something like 5,000 uh, lives that have been saved uh, through this process. Second thing is a dialogue. I can assure you the first time that these gang leaders were in the same room together, uh, the odio or the hate was palpable. The room vibrated. These are not people that uh, really want to be in the same room together. They've spent decades uh, trying to eliminate each other. Uh, barbaric acts. Uh, many of their families uh, have been uh, victimized uh, by each other. So just the fact that today we can get, I would say, 60 of, not just the Salvatrucha and the, and the 18, but 60 of the major gang leaders from the variety of clicas uh, in the same room together to discuss some of these issues, I think, is a, a, is a major accomplishment. We have tried to uh, adapt 
in Los Angeles uh, in a community-based uh, version. There are 12 municipalities in El Salvador which are participating in this. Again, a traditional, typical uh, DDR uh, kind of approach where by creating some sense of peace, um, trying to reduce violence, the communities, the families, the NGO community, the donor community, the businesses uh, can start to um, uh, reinitiate some uh, uh, normal uh, commercial activity. And you can go back. Uh, I think John's story of, you know, going to a fair. I, I mean, I went back to Valladolid uh, recently, an area um, in the Apopa region of El Salvador, if you know it, where there's actually three gangs on three different corners. Uh, one of the most violent areas. We're celebrating a year with no homicides. And they had a big festival with the Catholic and the Evangelical Church. Um, kids, families, etc. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to be too Pollyannish here, but uh, it did give me that feel of a, of a place that was slowly trying to recover uh, some sense of normalcy. Um, gangs have surrendered um, voluntarily the weapons, uh, and we hope to uh, do even uh, more. And I think the other thing that's very uh, interesting and very important, uh, and is reflective in this session, is that there is now an international and domestic discussion on this which in the past, uh, I don't think, really uh, would have happened. Um, what's missing? What do I think are some of the next steps? Uh, obviously, we need to promote in El Salvador and Honduras and elsewhere a broader multi-sectoral dialogue. This is not something that the government or donors or the OAS or any one sector of society can do. We need to be able to bring in all sectors of society that church, the business, um, NGO community, civil society, social actors, youth, uh, the families of the gangs themselves, um, the elected officials at various levels, and have a much broader discussion. Uh, and this is something that's been a real challenge uh, to do. I think there needs to be a regional discussion. Uh, what's the impact of these guys crossing the borders? Um, how do we uh, figure out what's an organized criminal and what's a gang member? How do we know where they're moving from the sort of turf or territorial, as I think John put it, uh, to the transactional? Uh, and these are issues that are, are, that are really important. Again, I think this dialogue with the international community, we've written to the United Nations, we believe that many of the traditional conflict mediation toolkits need to be adjusted, can be adjusted, uh, to deal with uh, these kinds of um, uh, <coughs> issues where there are criminal ranks and there are criminal actors uh, at play. Mm -hmm. I think it's very easy and we have to be very careful um, to not lump everybody into the sort of uh, organized criminal bucket or terrorist bucket or gang bucket. They are different um, and there are issues that need to be dealt with differently. Support victims. Um, as John said, many uh, people in many of these countries um, have been victimized and don't come forward because they're scared uh, and have a scar, a deep social, uh, cultural scar. And I think that one of the things that I haven't heard much, uh, um, much conversation about is how do, we, how do we do a much better job and how do we work with victims. Um, I think we need to look at the, the, the legal frameworks. Uh, these anti-gang laws, um, all that happened is everybody got maybe felt good, uh, but the unintended consequences is prisons are full. Uh, it drove down to an ever lower age uh, of people who were actually committing these crimes and actually working uh, for the gangs. Uh, and it's, in many cases, actually pushed it down to the girls um, and the mothers and the wives. Um, as a way of, uh, of, of avoiding the law. And I think, as John uh, mentioned, uh, to me, the real priority has to be a complete reform of the rule of law institutions. I think it's really good to have vetted units, but they're not sustainable if you don't have a proper salary, you don't have a proper uh, security net, you don't have a proper way of paying uh, for a uh, vocation. We need to make sure that police and community policing, a 
as the Chilenos have done, as the Colombians are doing, uh, as the, hopefully the Mexicans will do, becomes a vocation. I think we're proud of that to be a police. And police can reestablish uh, credibility uh, in these communities. Uh, today, that's not the case. And it's when you're a paying police, and I was on a reform commission in Honduras for you know, two years, when you aren't paying police, I don't care how often you bet them, but below the poverty rates, uh, you're asking for problems. Uh, and many of these countries have uh, you know, tax collection at uh, 10 to 15 percent of uh, their potential. Uh, and that's not a recipe for uh, creating a state uh, either. So confidence in these rule of law institutions uh, is the great multiplier. Um, I think the, the great negative is lack of confidence, obviously, in corruption. I'll stop there. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. How many of you have seen the movie and the band played on it? So, with that movie in mind, and I apologize for those of you that haven't seen it, and I promise I won't give away any spoilers, but to give you some perspective, my background is in um, public health and social work, and the population that I've always worked with has been adolescents and youth. I have very little patience for people over 25, 30 years old who continue to live a lifestyle that is detrimental to themselves and to their society. So with that said, um, I'm going to focus my presentation on that. Um, but something that was said earlier about exclusion, the more you push people to the margins, the more they're going to probably fight back. And some examples of that are in this movie. There's also examples of how economic interests, um, discrimination, uh, not understanding what to do, um, just really trying to find a way, so how do we get rid of these people? Maybe they'll all you know, just kill each other or, or they'll all die with this virus, which this, this movie is about the, um, how um, a, a major HIV AIDS epidemic was prevented in this country and the nuts and bolts of how that was prevented. So with that in mind, I often ask people, could you imagine if the United States had only assessed the HIV AIDS um, situation back in the 1980s? We'd be in bad shape. We'd be probably in worse shape you know, than we are now. I mean, it's sort of plateaued to some degree, and you know, there's been advances in, in medicine, there's been advances in treatment. We've come a long way of looking at people uh, who are still stigmatized and who are still um, not yet living the quality of life that they could. But I think, you know, we've come a long way. And we really <coughs> had to create a paradigm shift where we had really no choice uh, but to look at how, you know, do we not exclude folks affected by this, uh, which, which most of it was created by behavior, by individual behavior, and also, perfect, you know, uh, made worse by things around them in their environment. So with that said, I want you to think of gang violence and I want you to think of youth you know, within the same context. Many people have very little patience for gang members and many people have very little patience for adolescents. As the mother of two, I'll tell you, I worked in the Los Angeles County Juvenile Justice System for 10 years just to really get a handle on how to be a good parent when my own daughters reach adolescence. My oldest, my 16-year-old, uh, comes with me with her problems from her classmates, you know, I'm trying to be a therapist by proxy. And she tells me, Mom, you ruined adolescence for me. It's like, nothing I tell you shocks you. <laughs> so I'm not going to get too much into the historical context of understanding gangs in Central America. I think, you know, the uh, other panelists have touched a little bit on that. I will um, make some points that I think are important, especially as they relate, you know, to policies and practices. I think oftentimes people don't know um, the extent of how many policies uh, and practices are actually in conflict with each other. For example, when you look at child welfare in these countries, uh, it's not as child welfare as we understand it here. And yet money and resources are being pumped into the region for public safety at the expense of children. Uh, for example, there are some programs that won't take uh, kids who are gang involved, or that, even if someone says that kid was in a gang, and maybe that kid doesn't want to be in a gang anymore, and comes to this program for help, and the program says, I'm sorry, but you're not eligible according to our funding criteria, so good luck to you. So I will talk a little bit more about that, about how it is you know, that we can do this a little bit better without further excluding people, because the gangs have you know, come to be really good at the business of filling voids. 
and I will talk about specific populations, you know, that are left in the void, who are being basically um, taken under the wings of the gangs. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the work that my organization does. Don't worry about this, I'm very didactic. <laughs> so, looking back, this was written in 1998. This was um, something done, um, part of it was done by Donna de Cesare. There's a piece in here about Peruvian youth and how they were perceived as also a criminal element because of their passion for, for soccer. And they acted like the hooligans do in, in the UK when uh, the Manchester plays and whatnot. But this piece, I want to show you the historical importance of this. We have been talking about this for a long, long time. And I know that a lot of folks, you know, find this, you know, that this is new, and thanks to the media, we have almost created a collective amnesia as to what, you know, what was it that started this problem, and how is it that we got this way? So I strongly recommend that you read this. Um, Don de Cesare is one of the very few people that can give you the historical breadth and depth uh, of what happened in Central America. She was probably the first journalist to photograph a deported 18th Street gang member who was dying of AIDS. He contracted the virus in the United States, was deported, and he went to El Salvador to die. And Donna was doing a piece of something else, and she saw this kid all tattooed, just dying. And that was the first time that she documented a deported gang member. And look at where we're at now. But I just wanted to share that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, there's a lot that's been said, there's a lot that has been going on, and we really haven't yet learned how to build a better mousetrap to deal with this problem. Um, for those of us that have been here for a long time doing this work, um, as I like to call the usual suspects, it does get a little frustrating when we hear a whole new thing of like, recently this, or you know, this and that. It's, like, it's not recently. This has been going on for a while. Um, we're talking about a region in conflict. This is like a whole list of things, you know, that add to the problems. And that I think, you know, that as they add to the problem, we need to look at them as how do we bring them to the table and, you know, create collaborations across different sectors. When, for example, I have religion there. The reason why I say religion, you know, is a bit of a problem because they will also receive funding, but they will discriminate people who won't participate in their religious activities, sort of like the Salvation Army does here in the United States. If you want to come into our youth you know, shelter, this was like in Hollywood, we, have an, we had an issue with the Salvation Army there. If you want to stay in our youth shelter while if you're a runaway in Hollywood, you have to you know, come to our services and adopt our religion, and not everyone is ready to do those things. Yes, they need help, especially if they're in crisis. But we also have to be flexible. If we're talking about the survival of a young person, um, so many youth, you know, would turn away from the shelter and go back on the street to be prostituted, to be exploited, to be hurt. Um, I talk about other policies as they relate to economics, as they relate to foreign policy, as they, they relate to um, immigration. Um, gangs do fill the void of family. So as many parents leave their children behind, oftentimes they, there isn't a grandparent to take care of the child. They're left with an aunt or with a neighbor or with somebody. And eventually the gang becomes the family, even with you know, the high price you know, that that comes with. It was mentioned also that this is a very young region. These are the number of people under age 15. I'm talking middle school. So you have a third of El Salvador are a bunch of middle schoolers. How many of you have middle schoolers? <laughs> you know the pain, right? <laughs> it's a tough age group. They're not children, but they're not adults. And they're, they have all these developmental things going on that they need for society to really you know, step in and do its job. Guatemala, Honduras, very young populations. And we never think about this. When we think about the region, we think about public safety. We think about citizen security. You know, think about a middle school near your home. And try concepts of, you know, that have been applied to this region, to that middle school, and the issues that it has. And how you know, would you fix it if this middle school was in crisis? 
How would you deal with that? Would you put a bunch of armed guards with AK-47s and ski masks all around, you know, the neighborhood? What kind of kids would those grow up to be? What kind of concept, you know, would they have of the world? I'll talk a little bit about gender because I often think, and I appreciate that you mentioned that we often overlook the other half of the population um, of the world. But the first picture, uh, this is a mother during the war in El Salvador. The other picture, this is an 18th century mother in El Salvador. Uh, more and more, the role of women is, is changing, where they're not just idly standing by, being supportive of you know, their soldier husband during the war, or their gang member boyfriend you know, during this current uh, conflict, but rather they're at taking much more active roles. And they're also paying the price for it. Uh, there was a woman in San Pedro Sula named Julie. She was, a, she was a girlfriend of an MS gang member. Then he was killed, and she took over the narco uh, business, the parcel of narco business that he had. She became a gang member. That way, you know, she could have a little bit more power and control over this. She grew the business, and the other MS gang members you know, thought, we're going to take over this, or we're going to do this our way, and she's just going to be the, and she wasn't having it, so they murdered her. And when she was being buried, they went to make sure, you know, that nobody came back to avenge her death, so they murdered people at her, at her funeral, at the cemetery, including her sons. So it just goes on and on and on. Even within themselves, there are these ideas, you know, that there are certain rules and there's a lot of, information out there about you know how these things are structured and they're not. They tend, you know, to change oftentimes on a regional basis, on who's in the leadership structure at the time, and that can also change very quickly. Uh, we really don't understand oftentimes, you know, how they think or what what is it why is it that they do what they do. So you've got a situation that should be understood a lot better. And that's the duality of the victim-perpetrator role of these kids. Many of these kids were victimized as children. Um, and we look at our own child welfare slash juvenile justice system here in the United States. For those of you that have any interest in child welfare or have looked at into any of the information about children in foster care in the United States, we know that they don't fare well. We have created systems and we have changed policies to make sure that we help these kids because at some point we had a heart for them. You see that baby that was abandoned in the cold, you know, by, by its parents? We have hearts for these children. But all of a sudden, they become teenagers and they start acting out and they, they start getting in, in, in trouble with the law and all of a sudden we have no heart for them. And we have no understanding of how it is, you know, that children who are not cared for, who, whose traumas are not addressed, they are not able to go through a healing process and achieve a sense of well-being. We ask ourselves, where did we go wrong? I mean, we put it all on the child, but we never ask ourselves, you know, how we let them down. So this duality of victim perpetrator uh, becomes for the child as a way, it's like, I don't want to be a victim anymore. In this some zero world, I will not be the zero. And let's talk a little bit about money. There is no science in this. This is just my own observation. And I'm actually, uh, I'm currently doing a consultancy at the World Bank, and you know, since they're good with numbers, numbers, I'm trying to get them you know, to think of how can we actually do this and actually plug in real numbers in there. But I have found over the years, my experience has been, you've got the prevention population over there, and the blue, uh, uh, the dotted line is a typical population curve. I'm sorry, the other one. Yeah, so you've got this, um, you got this prevention population, you know, your after school programs, you know, mentoring, uh, midnight basketball, all of these things that we love to do for kids because they deserve it, because they need our protection, because they're a deserving population. We're going to throw money at that. We're going to do whatever it takes. We'll hold bake sales, we'll do whatever. And so there's a lot of funding, as you can see. That's what the inverted well curve is. But in terms of the gang population, the dotted greenish line is the gang population. So this, they're actually not that many. A lot of children are not actually fully active 
certified gang members. Okay, they may be lookouts, they may be the children or siblings of, but they're a minority. You look at this other end, okay? The Justice Policy Institute said that about 8% of the most violent crimes are committed um, by, by the population of gang members, about 8% of them. So of the 100% of a gang population, only 8% commit the murders and the rapes and the, the heinous crimes. The rest do other things. But they're not the majority of the population either. But look how much money we spend on prisons, on surveillance, on all sorts of stuff. You know, judicial systems, that's expensive. Then we look at the middle, which is what I like to call the intervention population. This is the gang member who's still a youth, who can still go either way. They're in a human development process by which when they reach their late teens, early 20s, they have a frontal lobe and they have an executive center by which they can reflect on right and wrong. And even if they survive all the insults to their brain and drug use and trauma, they're still able you know, to reach a turning point. So I've been warned that I have five minutes. Um, I want to talk about a little bit of our role and how sometimes these governments will look to the United States to sort of validate uh, what they do uh, in, their own, in their own countries. Um, this, is a, this is a Honduran newspaper. They basically said, well, the ATF said that it was an accidental fire where 360 prisoners uh, were killed. Yeah, in Comayagua. I was just there yesterday. And it's interesting because the Hondurans know what happened. But, you know, the, the news will say, no, the U.S. said we're, we're good, we're good. So we talk about transparency and justice. What, is this really, what does this really mean and what does it really look like? When hundreds of people are occasionally socially cleansed out of a population, we really have to think about what is it you know, that's going on and what a role in that, or a complicit role in that is. So looking ahead, it doesn't really look good because the things are changing. Um, I was just in central Honduras yesterday, and I was in this small town, which is actually not one of the bank's project areas, but it's actually an area that's considered, you know, to be somewhat safe and somewhat okay. And this is what the most of the population does. They hear nothing, they see nothing, they say nothing. But they will, on occasion, share with you things that we have been talking about and looking at here, such as community-oriented policing and how they're actually, many of them, walking hand in hand with the local narco-traffickers, and how they keep tabs on the town. And of course, there's also a lot of talk about you know, the police. Uh, while I was there, uh, two youth you know, came to me and shared with me, uh, these are two youth who have no parents. The father was murdered, the mother disappeared, and these youth live you know, with, um, with an uncle who can't wait to get rid of them. So he kicks them out of the house, and they roam around you know, the streets, <clears throat> and the police shot at them. No questions asked. These are kids, 18 and 19, and they were telling me about this, about where is it that we should go. And guess you know where they're staying? They're staying in the house of a deported gang member who also don't, doesn't want to join the situation in Honduras. He's already been approached by the local program to fall into the fray. And he doesn't want to. He just wants to live his life. He hasn't seen his family like in 15 years. He just wants to live his life. And here I am listening you know, to this deported gang member and these two kids talking about what options do we have when we can't do anything, we can't go anywhere, and all that's being offered to us is either death or, <coughs> or prison or, or getting out of here. So with the probably one minute I have, I'll just talk a little bit about what we do. We collaborate with nonprofit organizations or so non-governmental organizations. This is the Center for the Attention for the Return Migrant. I do a lot of work with deportees because that's one population that has been excluded uh, from pretty much everything, uh, even by their own governments. Um, we do transnational casework. If we have a youth that gets deported, we want to make sure you know that they have someone to connect with, and it's not the gang waiting for them with open arms. We do work with an accompanied undocumented children and youth that come from the region into the United States. 
advocacy and public education, sort of like what I'm doing here, sharing a little bit of what's, what's going on. Uh, Unfinished Business is a project that, in collaboration with the University of Maryland School of Law, we created a sort of Q&A for deportees who left behind unfinished business in the United States. And I think that's my time. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up to questions. Um, um, Mr. Feely said he could stay for another like 10 or 15 minutes, so I want to go ahead and open up the floor to, to you all. Maybe three questions and then we'll let the panel answer. We have microphones and then we do. We I can think just, hear you. just stand okay. up. Um, I wanted to ask if all of the panelists um, agreed that the El Salvadoran gang truce was a success and whether you would see it as something that should be a model for the region and if there are any um, reforms or suggestions that you can make on it. Um, my, my question is somewhat similar. With countries with like low incarceration rates like Germany and Spain supporting the truce, why is the U.S. not supporting the truce? Um, hi, my name is Prabhash Bhan, I'm the country director in Mercy Corps, Colombia. Um, I know the focus is on Central America. One of the concerns in Colombia, even though there is community policing, is the propensity for uh, after a peace deal is made, the demobilization um, um, opportunities won't be incentive enough for uh, members of FARC um, that are already spinning off into what is called BACRIM, Bandas Criminales. Um, what models available after the uh, uh, peace agreements in Central America for uh, demobilization efforts can take place for rural Colombia, not so much urban Colombia, for rural Colombia in light of strong economic incentives to continue with narco trafficking in, in Colombia. And maybe one more, you had one question. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. My name is Lauren Pound from the Inter-American Development Bank, and I just wondered if the panel could go into a little bit more detail about how gang violence affects education, how it interrupts children's education, how it affects graduation rates, whether by active recruiting at schools or just violent environments uh, at schools. Start with Susan, maybe on the truth. The truth, the I'd rather answer the education one. Um, I have nothing positive to say about the truth, so I'll just work home. Um, with education, I think you know that's uh, that's actually very good. I think we have this understanding that what I think we don't have an understanding as to why it is that more and more children are being forcibly recruited into the gangs. But if we look at the mushrooming of the prison population. The way that they see it is someone has to support us. Someone has to be able to send money in so we can eat, so we can, you know, have our cell phones in here. <laughs> um, so basically, it's created a sort of symbiotic relationship between the prisons and the schools, where, it's, where now, um, as youth, are basically seen as a problem, and they're very heavily targeted by the police. They are now looking to other populations that are not as much targeted by the police, and that includes children and women. So, but the real issue is even before the gangs were there, the education systems in these countries are not very good. Um, I know people who graduated from high school in these countries and I would peg, if I were to do an assessment as to where they would fare here you know, by US standards, they would still fare at an elementary school level. So there really isn't that much of an incentive. You have professionals in these countries with law degrees, medical degrees, who can't find a job. So what do they do? They immigrate and they work for eight bucks an hour at, at a Wendy's near Dulles because they make more money than, you know, so education really isn't a big incentive. But there was some talk about how being a police officer isn't a, a, a good thing. There really isn't that much of an incentive. And also, I'm not sure if you're familiar with how these systems work, but there are two shifts. Kids go into school in the morning and then they have nothing in the afternoon or vice versa. Because the whole, port, the whole point of that is for a half a day, they're going to go and work. They're going to help you know, bring home a way you know, to put food on the table and whatnot. So very early on, children are exposed to working and finding a way of supporting the family as best as they can. The gangs are just one more aggravation for them, getting in the way of their childhood and their education. But systematically speaking, they're already in a bad place. I would say simply to add to that that every dollar you spend on security is a dollar you're not spending on education. And I think your bank would 
World Bank has estimated the cost of insecurity in Central America to be anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of GDP. <coughs> so it's obviously a huge hit. Um, the truce. I think that this was meant to be, as in most of these things, a moment in time. On the 9th of March 2012, these leaders agreed to these five points. And we were going to start a process, a much deeper, better understood, well-documented process. I won't here go into all of the reasons why that never really happened. So I would not say that the truce of El Salvador is a model to be adopted elsewhere. I think that the process to get the guys together and no, I didn't say this, but we went and actually spent a lot of time in the communities talking to the mothers, the grandmothers, the daughters, the, the women. Because remember, the men are either in jail, dead, or hiding. Not, not all of them, I don't want to generalize, but... Um, so I would say that the genesis of the truce was okay. How it was implemented and the processes that were brought uh, along uh, were not. And, and a lot of that had to do with, uh, I think, the, how I would say in El Salvador, and I, I mean this with all respect and, and cariño and all of that, it's still a country that is very polarized. Just look at the electoral results. Uh, it may have had peace after the Civil War, but I don't think there was ever really a deep process of reconciliation. I think that what this country really needs is a, is a true national dialogue of what kind of country El Salvador wants, and Salvadorians want. Um, it's a very dynamic uh, population. I mean, you've got a great diaspora. There's a lot of positives. Uh, it's just how do you harness all of that energy in, a, in, in one direction uh, without all of these perceptions and baggage and chismes and, and rumors kind of getting in the way. So. The only other thing I want to say um, is, you know, you remember the games, and again, hard to generalize, it, it, there are differences between El Salvador, Honduras, and, and, and Guatemala, but they are essentially, their economy is essentially a subsistence economy. Um, you know, they're not buying helicopters or huge mansions or submersibles or any other of the sort of transnational organized crime uh, kinds of things that uh, we see and you think of. Uh, in fact, a few days ago, there was a full page, full page spread in most of the major dailies because the police had captured a kilo of cocaine. Well, that on the local market in San Salvador is about $12,000. So we're not talking about huge amounts of money. The extortions are small amounts on the buses, a lot of it to their own community. And the only other thing I would say is in Los Angeles, all of the investment, all of the working together, uh, integrated approach, managed to reduce the homicide rates, but the most difficult thing has been to replace the gang economy, the extortions. And if you look at the rates, they're almost where they were before they started this integrated approach. Thank you, Adam and Susan. Let me just jump in on the question of the truce. Um, the United States, as you know, was not an active participant in the truce. I would also say we are not an active participant at the table, one of the guarantors of the Columbia peace process. There's a lot of reasons for it, but the primary one is to recognize that the United States is not the panacea to internal conflicts, and that's effectively what you have. There are, as Susan pointed out, there are very good historical antecedents where we have contributed to the causes, uh, in particular with the, not in the Colombian situation, but in the gang uh, situation with uh, deportations, and it's undeniable when people go back and look at uh, Donna's work and others' work uh, about the genesis of it. But the fact is that the United States has a role to play that does not mean that the United States has a preponderant role to play. The truce was something that we did not participate in actively, but for goodness sakes, we certainly wish it well. The fact that the OAS participated in it, uh, the fact that there were others who worked and provided uh, information, provided 
uh, technical assistance. Uh, we certainly wish that it would work. I will say that truces among organized crime groups or gangs among folks who are, uh, you know, the term they use in Latin America is antisociales, are notoriously difficult to bring to fruition, uh, especially when you're talking about, uh, as I think Adam put it very well, uh, groups that are basically a violent expression of social exclusion. Um, the United States does, however, and I do want to say what we do do. Uh, I talked about some of the security things because that is what as uh, Susan rightly said, we only think about citizen security. That is the stereotype. Let me tell you a few things. I'm just going to take two minutes to tell you what we do do in a Central American context to focus on that all-important aspect of prosperity, of giving people the other opportunities. The United States has a program that we've had for a number of years called Pathways to Prosperity in the Americas. Basically what this looks to do is through our CAFTA and DR assistance, we provide economic uh, opportunities for small entrepreneurs and there is a strong focus on social inclusion. This is not going to the impresarios, to the takas of the world or to, you know, the Grete families or uh, the uh, Pollo Campero uh, of the world. These are going to small and medium enterprises, PMEs as they're called. Um, we also developed something called the Small Business Network of the Americas. In many of these countries, to start a business is a legal and licensed business, is a long jeremiad that takes a million bribes and 55 pieces of paper with wax seals on them. That is simply untenable. People have good ideas. There's tremendous entrepreneurialism in, throughout Latin America. How do you get those businesses up, running, registered? How do you ensure that they are paying taxes but also receiving the services of the government? We put them in touch through a virtual network and also through face-to-face -face meetings with small business development centers here in the United States. They're growing throughout Mexico, they're growing throughout uh, the Northern Triangle, and through this we hope to be able to assist in the provision of opportunities. We have a program called We Americans, the Women's Entrepreneurial Network of the Americas. Um, it's been stated here, it's been stated in Goldman Sachs reports, women are more responsible stewards of family money. Whether we like that or not, half that sky is more responsible. And those women, when they are given access to capital, access to training, access to markets, they tend to be successful. This is, a, again, a network where we bring people from the region up here to expose them uh, to small business, small women business owners in the United States. We have something called La Idea, which is a hemisphere-wide competition for creativity, to spur com competitiveness and creativity. It's basically sort of like, you know, uh, look who's dancing or who's got talent. Folks come with small business proposals. They are judged by a consortium of folks that we've brought in. It's not a State Department decision who wins, but we provide funding for that. We just had that selection. Univision covered it down there. We had people from the northern tier who were some of the winners. Sometimes just getting them that seed money and getting it to somebody who is, has a demonstrated plan and a vision and then keeping the mentorship of those people is what can break somebody out from the cycle of violence and the cycle of gang membership and the cycle of exclusion. We have something called Connect, Connecting the Americas 2022. This is a program whereby we seek to convene among the hemisphere, but we focus primarily on Central America, focus policymakers to have the discussions that are needed to get the regulatory and the tariff harmonization to do cross-border electricity distribution. Many of these places, as Susan knows well, as Adam knows well, they go dark after sunset. The provision of electricity, the lights in a neighborhood, midnight basketball, things like that, uh, is, is one sign in many places that you have got some kind of genesis of prosperity, literally and metaphorically, the light that comes through. Gangs tend to work best in darkness. Gangs tend to work best in shadows. They don't want to be seen. This is a program that isn't gang-focused, obviously, but it goes much beyond that. We also have education programs. There are programs that USAID implements uh, that seek to teach English language, uh, we focus on uh, those teenagers, those, those adolescents that can be pretty unruly and difficult. 
in an attempt to get them some basic rudimentary English connected up on the web. We have a program called Broadband for the Americas, seeking to work with local providers to expand that. I could go on for a long time, and it's not the details that are important. What I hope you will take away from here is that U.S. policy with regards to dealing with gangs, dealing with transnational organized crime, and dealing with the rule of impunity that exists in many of these places are far, far beyond simple law and order cop training programs. And we intend to continue that. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. For Katie, Al, for Congressman Farr, and all of our panelists, thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thank you.